I'm John Kenneth Muir, and I am the author of the upcoming book, Horror Films of the 1990s, and I'm here today to answer any reader questions. I'd be glad to tell you about Horror Films of the 1990s. It's a 700 or so page book that reviews over 300 films in detail that were released between the years of 1990 and 1999, mostly in the United States, but there are also are several uh, foreign films reviewed in the, uh, the book as well. And I also write a lot in there about the history of the 1990s, and that's sort of the thing that I've done in all my horror films of decade books, is I, I look at what was going on in the culture at the time, and how was that reflected uh, in, in the films, the horror films that were made uh, during the decade. That's, that's the reason really I do the books, is because I, I like to point those things out and, and learn more about the context of the 1990s. Uh, for instance, a big thing in horror films of the 1990s is um, the fear of uh, genetic science and also the, uh, the internet. Those were two big things with the, the Human Genome Project and uh, the advent of the World Wide Web. So you had a lot of movies like uh, Deep Blue Sea or Mimic or Jurassic Park or The Lawnmower Man that looked explicitly at those fears. And like I said, those come right out of the culture. I wrote horror films of the 1990s because horror films of the 1970s and horror films of the 1980s had been very well received, and I very much wanted to continue my investigation of horror films and how they shape-shifted through the decades. And the 1990s I was always really interested in, just because so many amazing things were happening in that decade. That's where you had the uh, Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas kerfuffle, you had the uh, Los Angeles riots, uh, the Y2K incident, uh, the Clinton impeachment. There were all these events going on in the 1990s as we turned away from the Cold War and sort of turned inward to the culture war. And so a lot of the horror films of the 1990s are these sort of culture war horror movies that, that look at all these issues of what was happening in America about race relations, affirmative action, women's rights, things like that. So that was really the big thing for me about why I wanted to write horror films of the 90s. Horror filmmaking has changed a lot between the 1970s and the 1990s, with the 1980s as sort of the middle or transitional ground. In, in the 1970s, horror was really almost, you'd say, marginal. The, the great horror films of the 1970s were ones that were about breaking taboos, shattering decorum, really transgressing. I mean, you think about titles like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Last House on the Left, Straw Dogs, things like that. I Spit on Your Grave, even great title. And those movies were really kind of dangerous. You, you sat in the theater and you watched those, or you, you watched my home video and you think, wow, these movies were not just really terrifying, but they were changing the way you thought about horror, and they were also telling you something subtextual about the culture. Sally, I hear something. Stop. Stop. This is the movie that is just as real. Just as close. Crazy! You gotta make Just as terrifying as being there. Please. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Now, by the time horror films got to the 1990s, a lot of that had changed because horror films had very much become A pictures, A list pictures rather than B pictures. Studios were putting a lot of money into horror pictures. They were expected to open the weekend strong. And because horror had sort of joined the establishment at that point, it was much harder to sort of have this subversive or spiky subtext to the films. The, the, you know, the titles for horror films in the 90s were things like The Temp or Species or Scream. You know, as opposed to, like I said, uh, I spit on your grave. So you could just see that horror films in the 90s generally were playing it safe to a, to a, uh, to a higher degree than the ones in the 1970s. Now, also, the 1990s, of course, had much more advanced special effects, but the special effects aren't necessarily the things that scare you in horror films. It's, it's more what the movie is about or how the movie is framed that really terrifies the audience. So, so very much in the 1990s, and, and this is why some people don't like 1990, 1990s films as much, um, they were just much safer. Now, there, there were exceptions to that rule. I mean, The Blair Witch Project, Last Broadcast, Candyman, those were still transgressive horror movies. But by the time we got to the 90s, the studios wanted to play it safe and homogenize the horror movie. I'm so scared. 
My favorite horror film of the 90s is actually uh, The Blair Witch Project, just because it was so forward-looking and different than what was being made. <laughs> search of the three missing Montgomery College students continues in Frederick County tonight. Ten days and thousands of man hours have been unable to produce any clues. We have a few leads, a um, few other options who we want to take advantage of and just try to put together some, uh, some pieces to this puzzle. Do you believe the occult may be involved in the disappearance of your son? You know, in the 1990s, we had all these sort of uh, big screen adaption, adaptations of... Uh, of famous horror stories. You know, we had uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, we had Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, we had Anne Rice's uh, Interview with a Vampire, and these were all big, lovely films, but they weren't really terrifying. They weren't really scary. They didn't get you on that gut level. But The Blair Witch Project, I mean, it, low budget filmmaking, very intense, uh, incredibly scary, and it just got you on that gut level. Um, in, in terms of the 2000s, I, I think horror has had a better decade in the 2000s than it did in the 90s. And then there are a number of horror films I really like from that era, like Wolf Creek, um, Zombieland, uh, the American remake of The Ring, um, Silent Hill, Brotherhood of the Wolf. You know, really, my rule about horror movies is that bad times make great horror movies. And, you know, certainly we had a lot of bad times in the 2000s with, you know, the 9-11 attacks, the Iraq War, the contested presidential election. The economic crash and the recession, all that stuff, you know, that contributes into making a really great horror movie because the culture is so royal and uncertain. Um, the 90s, like I said, it, 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 was, uh, it was a safer time. Even though we had all the culture war issues, we didn't have a, an enemy in the Soviet Union, Union, a sort of existential enemy. So um, I, I think the horror films of the 2000s were really great, and there were a lot of good ones there. Well, CGI really has affected the chill factor in horror films made today. And I like to go back to a line from David Cronenberg's remake of The Fly in 1986. Jeff Goldblum said something along the lines of, well, the computer can't really understand the flesh. It doesn't know flesh, something like that. And I think that's a colorful way of explaining CGI, actually. I think CGI works really well in science fiction or fantasy where you're creating these other worlds, and they don't necessarily have to impact you on that gut level. They don't have to terrify you. But in horror, I mean, it's all, it's all about the blood. It's all about the gore, it, it, it's all about our tactile, physical existence and, and the threatening of that existence. And somehow, at least so far, CGI hasn't really managed to capture uh, the flesh or the blood, I think, in particularly convincing manner. And that's why when you look at some of the werewolf films made today, uh, the Wolfman, uh, things like that, the Underwolf films, the werewolves look very fake and they're not particularly scary. Our eyes have almost this kind of barometer that can sense when something isn't really there and when, when something doesn't really have gravity or proportion or, or substance in the world. And, and, and that kind of thing is devastating to horror. The feeling that, well, something was added there later and the characters aren't really reacting to it or that doesn't really look legitimately like a werewolf. You know, and you, So you get that a lot with CGI right now. Now, I, I do think CGI is pretty clearly the way of the future and, and it's getting better and better. The CGI and Rise of the Planet of the Apes look fantastic. Um, I, I think it will eventually understand the flesh, but I, I don't think CGI is quite yet there. I first became interested in horror and science fiction a long time ago. I mean, it, it's kind of a funny story. I, I was only five years old. It was 1975, so I'm really aging myself. And my mother had the good sense, or maybe the terrible sense, depending on how you look at it, to sit me down in front of a TV series called Space 1999. And it was set in the far-flung year, of course, of 1999, which we've surpassed now. But um, it was about these astronauts on sort of an uncertain, uncontrolled voyage through space. And, and they were basically looking at Generation X, me, as a grown-up. And the second week the show aired, there was an episode called Dragon's Domain. And it featured a graveyard in space. And the heroes of the show, Martin Landau and Barbara Bain, uh, went to this graveyard of ships. And on one ship, they found this alien creature with all of these tentacles and it had just one big glowing eye and the, the thing would hypnotize people and then it would grab them and pull them into its mouth and then and the mouth was like this steaming orange maw and, and after a minute it would spit out the skeletons of the people it ate onto the deck of the spaceship and, and you know smoke would be rising from their desiccated remains and as a five-year-old this was just an incredibly powerful thing to me you know this
conjunction of the technological with the spaceship and the future uh, with something absolutely horrific, this monster that would just devour human beings. And, you know, that just fascinated me, and it just sent me on this path in my life, you know, into liking films such as uh, Alien and Aliens and Species, all, all these films that really combine the technological and the futuristic with something really horrific. So that's what got me started. My, my four-year-old son, whenever I ask him who his favorite uh, character or uh, person is in the TV show, he says, oh, I can't decide because, you know, I, I don't want to pick just one. And when it comes to directors, I, th I think I'm going to follow my son's wisdom because there are so many that I really like. Um, I really like John Carpenter, uh, Brian De Palma, uh, George Romero, uh, Sam Raimi. I hope I haven't missed anybody. But, you know, really the ones who've been working pretty much steady uh, from the 70s until now and you know they, they have you know really large bodies of work and, and they consistently return to themes that I find very interesting so I guess I have sort of a, a group of horror directors that I really like. My, my favorite writing form is actually nonfiction, um, and that's because ever since I was a little kid I've just been obsessed with film and television and I made it my goal in life to uh, make a good living by actually watching film and television. <laughs> That's terrible. But that, that was actually my goal in life. And, um, you know, nonfiction gives me the opportunity to, uh, to write about what I love and, and to sort of come up with these theories and to synthesize ideas ab about how I feel about films and directors and the context in which their films were made. I, I really get a kick out of doing that. I love the research angle. Um, you know, nonfiction also pays better, I can say. Um, I enjoy fiction a lot, but for me, nonfiction is really where it's at. I do have tips for authors who want to uh, stay prolific and, and have a career in writing. And, and that advice basically boils down to write every single day um, and write something formal. You know, it's not, not just an email. Don't just shoot an email off to somebody or post something to Facebook. Make sure that, that you, you, know, you write a blog, you write a review, or, or if you're a creative writer, write a chapter in your book. Do that every day and exercise that muscle. Um, because what you really need to do as a writer is sort of exercise critical thinking and, and, and exercise, you know, the, the, sort of your brand. You know, pick a brand. What, what are you good at writing? And practice that every single day. Um, I, I think that's probably the best advice uh, I, I can give. I, I just think the more you write, the better you become. And so anybody who really wants to write a lot has to get in the practice of writing every single day, sometimes on two or three topics a day. Um, and I, I think you'll be in good stead if you do that. The, the House Between is an um, independently created science fiction and horror website that I uh, 
made back in the year 2006. And I really thought at that time, I imagined it to be so, that the internet was going to become the great democratizer of film production because you wouldn't need a big budget, you wouldn't need studio backing, you wouldn't need uh, expensive special effects to tell your story. Instead, you get a relatively inexpensive camera, uh, a capable cast who is willing to work, and you could make and distribute your own films or, or even television programs, so to speak. And I decided, well, I wanted to be at the vanguard of that experience. And with a very talented cast and crew, we set about making 21 half-hour episodes, three seasons of this series, The House Between. And the premise of The House Between was basically that five strangers are trapped in, a, in an empty Victorian house, and they have no way to escape, so they're stuck with each other. It was sort of uh, no exit with a sci-fi or horror angle. And um, I really had a great time doing it, and we, we made, I guess, we made an episode a day. It was like a 30, 35-page script, and we only spent $700 per episode. So that, that was the deal. We were going to do it cheap, down, and dirty. Uh, and that's what we did. And I, I turned out to be very lucky, and the produ production turned out to be lucky, because it ended up premiering at about the time of the writer's strike. Maybe it was our second season uh, when the writer's strike occurred. And suddenly people were looking to the web for original content. Uh, and so we were nominated for some awards. And we actually generated a passionate fan base um, for The House Between. Uh, I'm, I'm just sorry that you know we ended it after three years. Uh, the DVD of, of the entire series will be coming out uh, in January of 2012. And I hope that will uh, reignite interest in the franchise a little, because I'd love to do a fourth season or uh, you know do a, a sort of reunion picture for The House Between. Of course, what happened with web television was we ended up competing uh, with, you know, Joss Whedon's uh, web uh, web productions. Um, excuse me, web productions. We we ended up competing with um, Star Wars and Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, and we were just like this little mom and pop show, you know. So it was it was kind of crazy. I, I was hoping we'd see more original programming, but instead, what we got was sort of another arm of the studio. It's like, okay, here's the here's the Heroes web series and. Here's the Battlestar Galactica web series. And so I was really happy we were nominated for awards because we were the only independent, uh, out of Hollywood uh, created show, you know, competing with, uh, you know, the big boys, so to speak. Uh, it was a great experience. The type of book I most enjoy researching is the one like horror films of the 90s or horror films of the 70s. And, and that's the one that's about a decade or a specific time because I get to take this, you know, relatively long span of 10 years and look across all these films. And I can see how from, you know, year one to year ten, uh, ideas developed or, or morphed or, or, or became prominent. And, you know, to me, I just really love that. I love to see, you know, what was happening in the culture and then what happened to films as a result of what happens in the culture. I mean, and sometimes, I mean, it just changes radically. You know, you're not expecting at the beginning of the decade that horror films will take one direction and then something happens. And, and of course, they do take that direction. And an example of that is in the 2000s where um, we, we had the Iraq War and the issue of terror and Abu Ghraib and torture and things like that. And suddenly, you know, horror films suddenly, you know, veered off towards covering all those topics, like in the Saw or Hostel films. So, you know, it, it's very interesting to watch the progression of horror films as they, they pinpoint uh, what's happening in the culture and then head off in, uh, into new territory. There is a film that I slighted that I got notorious feedback for, and I definitely learned my lesson. You know, I, I like to say, hell hath no fury like an Italian horror film fan scorned, and I really think that's true. In, in horror films of the 1980s, I gave uh, the movie The Beyond by Lucio Fulci a, a really bad review. And I, I, seriously, I've never heard the end of it. Uh, and, you know, I like Italian horror films, I, I, especially stuff by uh, Argento. I, I, I think he's great. Um, and there are some Fulci films that I like very much, but I, I did not care for The Beyond. I, I gave it, I guess, what you'd call a scathing review, and, uh, and some people have never forgiven me. There, there are quite a few films that really set the standard for what I think is a great horror film. And a couple of those titles would be Rosemary's Baby, uh, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, John Carpenter's Halloween, Last House on the Left, uh, Straw Dogs, uh, George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, for instance. And all of those films, if you look at it, are kind of about this idea of normal life. Uh, and, and, and things are normal until something happens and you veer suddenly off into terror. 
And you can never know the terror is coming, you can never know what shape it's going to take, but suddenly your life is different. And in some way, I think this really mirrors human existence. I mean, we don't have the answers to a lot of questions in life. I mean, why do people we love come down with cancer? Why would someone we love die on, a, you know, in a plane crash or a train crash? I mean, these are the questions we grapple with. It's, you know, cruel fate, random fate. I mean, we have to deal with these issues of loss and death, mortality uh, in our lives, and we just really can't get good answers about why it happened. We, we search for those answers, and I think horror films really capitalize on that fear and ambiguity and uncertainty uh, in our lives. You know, you can be driving through rural Texas and, you, you know, gee, you run out of gas, and uh, what happens? You, you know, you run into a family of cannibals, right, and they try to kill you and eat you. I mean, there's no logic to it. There's no, there's no way you could have walked out of that. It's just the way human existence is, uh, that sometimes you take a wrong turn uh, or are faced with something you don't want to face. So I, I think a lot of the movies I named really deal with that idea in, in a real trenchant and powerful fashion. And for me, that's the key to a good horror movie. My role models career-wise all come from the um, terrain of film and TV reference books, you know, the kind of books I write. When I was a kid, I just voraciously read all of these film and TV reference books. And, and I, I still have them, and I'm proud to have those books on my shelves. You know, I loved David Gerald's The World of Star Trek. Um, there was another book in 1977 by Gary Geraney called Fantastic Television, which just looked at all these different science fiction television shows. And gosh, I love that book, and I still consult it. Uh, as far as horror is concerned, I really love um, Paul Gans, if that's the way to pronounce his name, book about George Romero called The Zombies That Ate Pittsburgh. It's just sort of a film-by-film, behind-the-scenes um, story of of George Romero and the films he made between Night of the Living Dead and, and I guess maybe it went up to uh, right before Monkey Shines in 1988 if I, if I recall correctly. I mean it's just a great book. You know I, I love the books that sort of taught me how to do it and, and gave me ideas about how to do it so th those are really my heroes. Um, I decide my next book topic basically on what I want to do. I mean I hope my career has an overall arc and I'm, I'm headed in, in the direction I want to head. Um, you know, I've done horror films of the 70s, the 80s, and now the 90s, and I very much look forward to doing horror films of the 2000s. I sort of feel like it's it's the thing I was I was meant to do is, is to look at these you know historical periods and and look at the culture and the horror films. You know, so I, so I pick what I want to do as much as I can, and and I pitch projects that I want to do. Now, the reality of the publishing business is that you don't always get to do the projects you you pitch. You, you would go to a publisher perhaps and say, well, we would really like somebody to do a book on this director or a book on this film. And I'm always happy to do a, a book like that, assuming I like the subject matter, you know, because writing a book, it's sort of like um, falling in love and being, being married for a year. You're going to spend a lot of time with that subject uh, and thinking about that subject. And if you don't like that subject or, or want to be involved in that subject or enjoy that subject, it's not worth it to do a book about it, even though you're going to have a published work at the end of it. And, and I think that's why sometimes, you know, some books come off as bitter or unhappy, you know, because really maybe the writer would have rather been pursuing another project. So my, my sort of rule of thumb about the topics I pick is that it has to be something I love and enjoy. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm very happy to do it. But I also like to pick my own projects, and I've been very fortunate that I've been able to get the books out um, that I pitch, uh, but by a pretty large proportion. Now, my next, uh, my next book coming out will be um, in spring of 2012, and it's the second in a uh, Limelight Edition's Music on Film series, um, and it'll be about Prince's film Purple Rain. It's sort of a behind-the-scenes story of the making of Purple Rain and a critical analysis and interpretation of the film. That's the second, um, that's, that'll be my second book in that series. The first one I did came out in 2010, and it was on one of my favorite uh, music-oriented films, uh, This is Spinal Tap. So right now, horror films of the 90s will be coming out, and I also have an essay in uh, Dexter and Philosophy about why Dexter may actually be a superhero. So that, that's sort of where I am right now in, in, in my books. I think the musical TV series Glee has had a really great effect on the musical genre. Back in 2004, I actually wrote a book about musicals. It was called Singing a New Tune, The Rebirth of the Modern Film Musical. And it looked at the era from, I think, like 1996 to 2004. And you, you have movies there like Moulin Rouge and Dancer in the Dark and Chicago. You know, all of these films that were really attempting to bring the musical back, um, you know, with varied degrees of success. And everybody's always asking the question, you know, is the musical dead? Uh, and, you know, I think Glee is proof that the musical is not dead. 
and, and the reason there's that problem with the musical is that it, the musical is a very old genre. I mean, we had it at really the beginning of sound film. And the musical, by its nature, is very artificial and theatrical. We sort of have this paradigm of people bursting out into song. But yet, the sweep of film history is that we're moving from the artificial and theatrical to the more naturalistic, the more realistic. So we don't necessarily accept that paradigm anymore that you know people are going to burst out to song. It's not into song. It's not necessarily something we're looking for in our films. But Glee is sort of the latest iteration of the very famous musical form of the backstage musical. But what it does, I think, is week in and week out, it gets everybody used to the idea of seeing people sing and perform songs and you know do what's done in a musical. And it's better than just say like reality TV, like uh, um, American Idol, because it, it, it's not done live. You know, it, it, it's rehearsed. You know, you've got great production design. You've got all these things going on with it, so that you really are creating a mini musical every week. So I, I think uh, you know, for the musical, I think that's a great thing. You know, what we saw in the 1990s was that for a large uh, for a large proportion of the time, horror really migrated to television with programs like The X Files, Millennium, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. What we see in this decade with Glee is the idea that maybe the musical is trying to make a comeback through television. So maybe next day, next decade, all the people who have sort of been, I don't know, indoctrinated by Glee, let's say, uh, will will be ready to go see musicals on the big screen again in ten years. So I, I think Glee is a, is a great show and it's performed a, a great service for the genre. It's very difficult to determine uh, sort of. For me, you know, which I like better, television or film. I, I like both very much in terms of horror and science fiction. I think I think they're both great, and one of the reasons it's hard to make that determination is they've really changed places in the last five years. You see, originally, film could be very niche. Uh, I mean, like I said at the beginning of this interview, horror was really this sort of marginal thing. You know, these horror films were being made independently outside of Hollywood, and then they go play at, at these theaters, you know, grindhouse theaters and things like that, and you had to catch it. It, it wasn't expected that it was going to pick up a mass audience. But now the way that film works is that basically science fiction horror films are expected to open big. They're expected to bring in everybody the first weekend. So horror and science fiction can't really be niche genres anymore. They can't be. Now television has taken the opposite approach. Television used to be homogenized. You had three channels, and you know you, each channel was expected to get a third of the audience, and, and everything had to be so sort of generalized that uh, you know anybody could pick it up and watch it and not be alienated. But in the last couple of years, we've had sort of what I call the balkanization, you know, of network television, where we have all these cable stations and such. So now we're getting you know great niche programming like Dexter, The Walking Dead. Mad Men, things like that. So now you can sort of really channel your interests into these programs. So, you know, it's really hard to pick which, which you like, television or film, better because, you know, there's a lot of interesting stuff in both, and I, I've always been a fan of both. My favorite horror writer, that's a little bit of a tough one because, of course, the knee-jerk instinct is to always say Stephen King because he's worked for such a long time, has such a vast body of work, and, has, I mean, just writes amazing books. But there are, there are also other great horror authors out there. I really like uh, Scott Nicholson, for instance, um, and Scott Smith. Uh, I'm a big fan of Shirley Jackson. Um, you know, I'm always looking for a new horror writer uh, that I can get into, and, and there's really no shortage of them. So, you know, Stephen King still dominates the field, of course, but, but there are a lot of other great uh, horror authors out there. At corporate events or conferences or, or seminars or universities or conventions or whatever, I, I mean, I just love to talk about horror films and science fiction films and science fiction television, things like that. I did a talk recently at Hampton Sydney University in Virginia called Space 2011, and it looked at uh, American culture and the final frontier and how sort of outer space programs have changed with the decades, like Star Trek in the 60s, Space 1999 in the 70s, Farscape in the 90s, Firefly and the remade Battlestar Galactica uh, in, in the decade just ended. So, I mean, really, you know, I like to talk about anything. I, I do a seminar called The Savage Screen, which is about the real cutthroat horror films of the 1970s. I, I do one about the slasher films of the 1980s. You know, anywhere I'm invited to speak, I, I love to talk about whatever, you know, whatever interests people. Uh, it's, for me, it's a lot of fun. I, I've always been fascinated by uh, the idea of teaching and, and teaching sort of what I've learned in the science fiction horror genres to, to uh, other students of that genre. And I, and I also learn things, too. I mean, that's the great thing about my blog is that, that you know, I write these reviews, and 
people write in these you know excellent and erudite comments about aspects of films that I hadn't even thought about. So for me, uh, lectures are the same way. It's really a, a two-way street, and I, I get to deliver my learning, and uh, the people who are listening get to share their learning with me. The, the rise of the PG-13 horror film is sort of disturbing in two ways. Uh, it's disturbing because horror is really supposed to be transgressive and marginal and taboo-shattering and decorum-breaking. And if you're going for the PG audience, you're not going to be able to do any of those things, really. So it seems, it seems a fool's errand to try to water down horror into the PG-13 terrain. Um, and that's one reason it's disturbing. The other reason it's, di it's disturbing is if that's not being done, and for some reason we are starting to show people younger and younger uh, you know, stuff that is more graphic, I, you know, I'm not convinced that's a great thing. I mean, I'm not approved. I love horror movies. But, but you know, there, is, uh, there is an appropriate age for horror movies. And you know, I, I know as a horror movie fan, I, I don't want to feel bad uh, you know, about the films I love because uh, you know, they were seen by people who never should have seen them in the first place. You know, my fear is always that's where censorship is going to come in, is that um, you know, people are going to complain about it because they took their kid to see the latest Chucky movie, something like that. And of course, the Chucky movies aren't designed for kids. So you know, there's a big problem there, and I don't believe in censorship in, in any way, shape, or form, but either PG-13 horror movies are either too watered down or they're not watered down enough. And that, you know, that sounds like a contradiction, but it's just a real troubling terrain for horror movies to be in. Um, you know, I, I think it's really an effort to try to homogenize the films for everybody when it's perfectly fine, I think, to have an R-rated horror movie that really scares you, and heck, just don't bring your kids to it. Do I think movies like Twilight are good for the horror genre? That is an excellent question. And you know, there are a number of horror fans, horror bloggers, horror scholars, and historians who really, really hate the Twilight movies and feel they're a real sort of downgrade to horror, that they're, um, that they're really poor. I don't think the quality of the films uh, is particularly high, but I, I don't have any hatred for them. And furthermore, I do think it strikes a bit of an elitist note to try to ostracize Twilight from horror. Um, and the reason I say that is, I, I, as a kid, I remember when Star Wars uh, hit uh, in 1977, and there were a lot of people saying the same things that people say about Twilight, about Star Wars then. And I love Star Wars. It spoke to my generation the way a new generation is spoken to by Twilight. Twilight films, or Harry Potter, for instance. And, you know, Star Wars was great, um, but a lot of people said, well, you know, it's a pastiche, it's pulpy. All those things were true, but Star Wars was a gateway to better and deeper science fiction. I mean, after Star Wars, what did we get? I mean, we got Alien, we got Aliens, we got Blade Runner, we got a number of really fantastic films. We got, we got a number of great television series, too, out of that. So the success of Star Wars only made it better for the science fiction genre. And I tend to think the same thing is true of Twilight, though I, I know I'll probably get stuck with Spears for, sta for saying that, is I think that it introduces a lot of people to horror, and as those people grow older and more mature, they'll seek out deeper uh, and more interesting stories and, and better horror films. So I am not anti-Twilight, though they don't speak to, to me and my generation, I think, as strongly as they do to the younger generation. But I, I see nothing wrong in that generation having a series of horror films that it really loves. I, I think that's great for horror. My, my favorite demon film, far and away, is uh, William Friedkin's The Exorcist. And even though I'm really inured to horror films at this point, because I've seen so many of them, that's one of the few films that I will not watch when I'm alone in the house. It just terrifies me too much. And, and I think part of the reason it's so terrifying is the sort of almost cine verite uh, documentary approach of it, uh, starting with the travelogue in Iraq in the beginning with the archaeologist unearthing these weird relics, and then going to the hospital with Regan as she gets a spinal tap, and has all of these really horrible tests performed on her, and then the movie just absolutely kicks you, you know, in the third act of what happens in Regan's bedroom with the, you know, the, the head spinning around and uh, the split pea soup and all that stuff. And that movie just terrifies me no matter how many times I see it. Um, I also really like uh, Pumpkinhead, which is about a, a demon who is sort of uh, vengeance personified, and it, it has a really sort of heart-wrenching performance by uh, Lance Henriksen in it that I really appreciate. Um, I guess those would be my top two demon films. Deep in the Appalachian Mountains, they say that an act of evil shall never go unpunished. <laughs>
dare they tell of a creature who shall come from nowhere, born from the blood of the innocent, to hunt the guilty, and they call it Pumpkinhead. Would I like to write a horror movie? Yes, I, I, I very much would like to. And I've written a script for one called The Dead Side of the Street. Um, it's sort of a retro slashers film uh, from the 1980s, something like that. Um, I've actually produced my own independent and very cheap and not very good horror movies. I made one that uh, blended Wes Craven and Woody Allen. It was called Annie Hell. Um, I really like that. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love to do something like that on, on a bigger budget with more resources. But uh, hell yeah, I'd, I'd love to write a horror movie. I'm, I'm out there. Can I, can I give anybody my information? <laughs> Are remakes good for horror? That is a really prickly question. Um, you know, certainly in, from the 90s through today, we've seen a lot of horror remakes, and in some senses they can be they can be very interesting, and in some senses they they feel very pale in comparison to the originals. I mean, the remake of The Haunting in 1999 was really terrible because it just depended on special effects. Um, you know, we have a remake upcoming of John Carpenter's The Thing. But, of course, John Carpenter's The Thing was a remake of a film from the 1950s, and, and I love John Carpenter's The Thing. So, I don't know, maybe it's a generational thing. You know, I'm not sure. Um, the remake of The Ring I thought was quite good. The, uh, I liked The Grudge, which was another uh, remake of a Japanese film. Uh, you know, I think that for my own sanity, what I've sort of decided as far as how I review horror films and horror film remakes is that I have to really take each one on its own merits. Because if I go in and I decide I'm going to play the you know the cranky old man and say oh all remakes are bad damn it you know if I do that then you know then you end up missing some good stuff but but the fact of the matter is that not all remakes are good and many of them are terrible and, and the reason that a lot of them are terrible is simply that um, it's the same thing I've been talking about is that they have to be homogenized you know the Texas the Texas Chainsaw Massacre when it came out I mean there's never been anything like it. Um, and it was radical and made out outside of Hollywood, and, and it was it was you know gleefully politically incorrect. You can't make a studio film like that today. You can't make that within the system. It's just impossible. You know, I've talked to um, editors of horror films for my books, and they say, you know, this movie did have subtext when we made it, but we were ordered to edit out all the subtext. You know, when when we completed the final cut of the film. You know, as long as that kind of thing is happening to make horror you know, homogenized and safe, um, remakes aren't going to be as interesting as the films that the remakes of. They, they just can't be. Um, that said, I did not think the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake was terrible. I thought that um, it was nowhere near the work of art that the Toby Hooper film was, but that as just a roller coaster ride and a scary film, it worked just fine. So I guess it might depend on what you're looking for, too. I mean, as someone who grew up with the horror films of the 70s, I don't just want to be terrified, although that's the first and most important thing of a horror film. I want to be somehow informed or illuminated about what it's saying about me and the human equation and what's happening in the culture. Uh, and I think most remakes tend not to be able to do that because they're so safe. Who would win in a fight, Dexter or Patrick Bateman? What the hell is going on? Why'd you do it, Joe? Why'd you kill Janet? I had to. Do you know how expensive a divorce is? What would Jesus have done? Can we go now? We're not through yet. That is a great question. Um, my gut tells me Dexter would win. Uh, I think Dexter... Uh, has more experience as a serial killer under his belt. Um, he has to navigate uh, complex relationships with his co-workers and family on a daily basis and uh, not be discovered. You know, Patrick Bateman, you know, he, he was sort of on the uh, knife's edge of sanity and just kept going down, 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 becoming more insane. And I mean, to, such as to where at the point, he was at the point where he was confessing his own crimes at one point. You, you can't do that if you're going to be a, a successful serial killer. Um, and I believe in American Psycho, we were sort of left to even imagine that maybe some of what happened with Patrick Bateman could have been in his mind. Um, so I, I think uh, Dexter wins far and away there. God, 
forgives us. <laughs> Don't you hear how foolish you sound? Uh, I want to thank you all for uh, listening to me uh, today talk about uh, horror films and about writing and science fiction film and television. It's been a real pleasure to share this time with you. Uh, if you're looking to purchase horror films of the 1990s, uh, you can go to the um, publisher's website, which is uh, mcfarlandpub.com, or the easiest way to go is to order it through amazon.com or bonjanobles.com. Um, also, please visit me at my website, which is johnkennethmuir.com, or at my blog, which is reflections, and reflections on Film and Television at blogspot.com. I blog just about every day. Uh, we're finishing up there a look at all of James Cameron's films, and we'll be starting uh, a review of the Matrix film series next week. So I really hope you'll join me there and look for horror films of the 1990s.